So sponges are particularly important for several reasons. They filter vast quantities of water. It's been estimated early 2000s that what the sponge communities at that time could turn the entire water column of Florida Bay, and when I say Florida Bay, we're talking here in, this, in the middle Florida Keys, north of the island chain, would turn the water column over in, in a couple of days. So that's just a tremendous filtering potential. Sponges have within their tissue microorganisms essentially turning nutrients into forms that other organisms can use. Large structure forming sponges serve as habitat for organisms such as spiny lobsters, stone crabs, juvenile fishes. My name is Bill Sharp. Uh, I work for the Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission's uh, Fish and Wildlife Research Institute. And I oversee our restoration ecology program. As part of that program, we've been working with sponges, sponge restoration research specifically, since about 2016. We're primarily working on a nearshore hard bottom habitat. The habitat that occurs oh, approximately a mile on either side of the island chain down here. Usually found there are uh, organisms such as sponges, octocorals, small stony corals, and it's a particularly important part of the coral reef ecosystem is this habitat is used by a myriad of organisms as a, ju a juvenile grow out. Small organisms settle in these nearshore environs seek shelter there, grow up before moving off to the, uh, the coral reef proper. Sponges are very simple creatures. They've proven amenable to just vegetative fragmentation. Thank you. So this is a loggerhead that we got from one of our nurseries. You can see it's still fused to the brick, uh, but at this point it's large enough that we can repropagate from it. So we'll make our first cut to separate it from the brick. A sponge can be cut up, placed on some type of object that's hard that it can attach to, and you produce more sponges. A lot of research in the early 2000s was just working out those type of methods. Over the uh, decades, the nearshore habitat along the Keys has changed dramatically. But when I came down here in the early 90s as a spiny lobster researcher, sponges were very common. A few months after I, I came on board here at the South Florida Regional Lab, we were working on a project in Central Florida Bay when a bloom of blue-green algae inundated some of our sites. And after a couple months, uh, we went back and the large structure-forming sponges were dead. Uh, that was 1991. It occurred again in 1992. And since that time, these blooms have occurred periodically uh, up until the present day. And so large portions of that central Florida Bay area are devoid of large structure forming sponges. Once they're impacted that way, it takes a long time uh, for them to recover, you know, on, on order of about a decade or so. So in here we have some brown branching sponges. So we went and grabbed these ones from our stirrup nursery this morning. So they're up on bricks. We propagated these ones probably about a year ago. So these are some of our faster growing species. So we don't have to wait quite as long to repropagate them as we do with the loggerheads. So we can go ahead, chop these ones up, zip tie them to bricks. So here's three pieces. We'll leave that guy. And it is one of our faster species. Um, and then it's also, you know, maybe a little more sensitive than our loggerheads. One of the cool things about these is it's a branching sponge. So it's the only sponge of our six species that we focus on that is actually a branching sponge, so it provides a different, you know, shape essentially that attracts juvenile fish. So again, these guys, we just kind of zip tie them down as best as we can. Thank you.
takes them a few months to heal from the cut and then diffuse to the bricks and then we get to go back out and snip all the zip ties off. On our full field days where we really just focus on propagating in our nursery, we we'll usually propagate about 300 sponges. We've honed in on uh, six large structure forming species. The loggerhead sponge, the vase sponge, brown branching, yellow sponges, glove sponges, and sheep wool sponges. Some species of sponges, particularly the loggerhead sponge, have within their tissues soniferous organisms like snapping shrimp and such. If you've ever been snorkeling on a healthy hard bottom site and you hear the snap crackle pop, what you're hearing likely are those what we call infaunal organisms inside the sponges producing sound. So you can see the snapping shrimp that live in, uh, in the canals in the loggerhead. What we're beginning to understand is you know, uh, th that sound is important. Larval organisms uh, use that uh, to orient to that hard bottom community. So it's a, it's a signal. So you know, when you lose sponges, you also lose that. We have three nursery locations, two that are set up just north of Marathon in the Middle Keys, and we have a third that's down in the Lower Keys on the, just on the other side of the Seven Mile Bridge. Set the nurseries up so hopefully they're safe from uh, cyanobacterial bloom effects. This was the first nursery we established back in 2017. It's about the size of half a football field. Our propagation season is fall, winter, spring. The way these days go is we first have to go out and find enough donor sponges, and then we will take them right to the nursery. We've gotten pretty good at multitasking as a team, so usually while half of the people are in the water searching, the other half will be chopping up the sponges uh, already. And then by the time we actually get to the nursery, we're pretty much ready to tie them to, them to the bricks and then we'll hand them off to snorkelers in the water who will lay them out, usually at least half a meter apart, just so they have some space. It's still at the experimental stage. There's still a whole host of questions that need to be answered you know, to, to ultimately you know, uh, reach our vision of you know, how do you get there to really scale up sponge restoration to an ecological, meaningful scale. How do you grow sponges efficiently in nurseries? Yes, sponge nurseries work. The problem when you do that, there's a lot of sponges that are unnaturally high densities. And what we were seeing is, well, it took them a long time to grow. And we think that's just because they're in unusually high densities, and so there's competition. They're all after the same particles in the water column. But how do we get them to grow faster? You know, how can we make that more efficient? We've also been estimating what are the costs. There's a big piece of information, you know, that's, that's valuable. Getting low on sponges. Our primary goal of the next couple of years is to develop a sponge restoration strategy for Florida Bay. 